Hey, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. Let's talk about ketos. Are you keto curious? <laughs> it's such a big trend nowadays. And you know, what happens is that we always want to think that there's like, uh, I don't know, like magic heroes and magic enemies when it comes to nutrition. Uh, back in the 80s, the magic enemy was fat. And we've gone through this rhythm to where we've gone the opposite way. We realized that was a mistaken idea and that just cutting out all fat was not really a helpful strategy because you could cut out fat and replace it with junk carbs. That really the quality of all of our foods is what matters more than just the exact ratios or types that we're consuming in terms of the macronutrients, especially within the category of fuel. And fuel, I include ketones, fats, carbs, and alcohol, which shouldn't be a lot of your fuel, but those are the main fuels. And apart from alcohol and ketones, which we'll talk about, the fats and the carbs, honestly, the way you rearrange them is probably less relevant than how high of quality and the total quantity that you're consuming. So backing up to the time we thought about the last villainous fat, then the natural follow-up is, oh, I guess fats really weren't that bad. And it turned out that you know, a speck of olive oil on your toast wasn't going to kill you. But then the thought process said, okay, so if it wasn't fats, it must have been carbs. So now we've gotten carb phobic. And the cycle that goes on, in the case of the fat world, for example, the first phase was low fat. And then a lot of the expected benefits weren't really materializing. So the next phase was fat free. So if this villain, if eradicating this villain didn't get us where we want to go, then we must have missed some of them. We must not have gotten all of them. We've got to do it harder. So that's how the whole low fat thing doubled down and went fat free. And honestly, it's predictable that the low carb thing now is going carb free. <laughs> and now it's going to keto. Now you need to go keto. The same thing is going on in the paleo world. They thought that these lectins in foods were evil and bad for us. So we cut out the lectins from grains. Well, now there's a book saying we should cut out like all foods that have high quantities of lectins. And that's kind of doubling down on a wrong idea too. You know, lectins are actually good for us. There are some that are dangerous, but we don't really eat them. And honestly, all foods have a lot of lectins, even though not all have been quantified. So when an idea quits working, before we abandon it, we often double down on it. And a big part of the keto movement is now doubling down on the low carb movement. Because many people have tried going low carb and maybe saw some initial benefits, but didn't really get the lasting benefits they thought. Now here's the mindset behind the keto movement. So the general mindset is that if you put your body into ketosis by eating a ketogenic diet, that you're somehow gonna make this like chain reaction take place in which your body is just burning up fat out of control. And it just like doesn't matter how much food you eat, if it's all ketogenic food, your body's gonna like out of control, burn up fat, and you'll burn up all your body fat, and you'll end up being thin and healthy and having perfect brain function. That's obviously simplifying and generalizing and maybe being a little lighthearted with it, but honestly, it is the idea. The idea is that the quantity of fuel you consume is not relevant if you're in a ketogenic state. That's the bias behind it. Now let's talk a bit more about what this means and unpack some of those biases and see what's the kernel of truths behind that because there's almost always some and what's the reality behind it. So ketones, what are ketones? Well, they're called ketone bodies and well, they're not really bodies, but they're alcohol-related compounds, aldehyde-related compounds. And they're really another version of fuel. And this can be a fuel that we consume like there are versions we can take as supplements like medium chain triglyceride, which have a high amount of ketones, or purer ones like beta hydroxybutyrate. So we can ingest those. And remember, I lumped them in that category of fuel. So carb, fat, ketones. Somewhere along the way, the law of thermodynamics actually does apply like a lot. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, if you're taking an X amount of fuel, your body's going to burn it or store it. No way around that. So a ketogenic diet is one in which your only fuels force you to burn fats in a way that makes ketones. Now, your body burns fats best when you've also got some carbohydrate and some protein. There's compounds called oxaloacetate that you make from protein and carbohydrate, especially carbohydrate, that helps you burn fat more effectively by a process called beta oxidation. If you're getting so little carbohydrate and protein and your body is using skeletal muscle, then it may be hard to break down fats by beta oxidation. 
then you've got to start making fats into ketone bodies. But all we're doing is really rearranging one energy form for another energy form. This is still the second law of thermodynamics. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. There's no way by which you can do a high intake of fat on a ketogenic diet and have yourself waste away and wither away and get slim. In fact, there was a large study done looking at just this. And they had people on controlled diets. One was half carbs, a quarter sugar, poor quality foods. The other one was matched calorie per calorie, but it was ketogenic. No carbs, almost no protein, all fats. And, and it was designed with the hope to show that there would be some big metabolic advantage to being in ketosis in terms of fat loss and how the body was burning fuel. Well, it actually backfired. So what the study showed was that there was more fat loss, calorie per calorie, in the group eating a lot of carbs than in the group on ketogenic diet. Now, not a big difference, but there was a slight advantage. So there was not any advantage to the ketogenic diet, in fact, a slight disadvantage. So here's the difference between metabolic ketosis and the ketogenic diet. So metabolic ketosis, any time that you're not getting enough fuel, your body will convert fats into fuel and eventually your own fats if you run out of glycogen. And that process does make some ketones. And in most cases, we do that every day over the course of the night. And that's how we keep our blood sugar and energy steady when we're not eating for a long period of time. So you can go into metabolic ketosis on a diet that's not making this up. You could eat nothing but rice. And let's say that you needed about 2,000 calories per day. And you got about 1,700 calories from only rice. You're going to spend time in metabolic ketosis. There's nothing magic about the foods you consume. It's the fuel quantity that determines whether or not you go into ketosis. Now, ketogenic diet means all you can do is burn ketones. That has no bearing on whether you're getting too little fuel, too much fuel, just the right amount of fuel. So a ketogenic diet has no apparent, apparent ways by which it engenders fat loss in your body, unless there's a fuel deficit. And only if there's a fuel deficit. But honestly, you achieve the same or perhaps a greater level of fat loss when you're getting fuel deficit, but a broader range of fuel. And there are some biochemical reasons by which your body actually burns fat better, more efficiently, when you're not in ketosis. You can burn fat better for fuel when you've got some more carbs, when you've got some protein. And this is called beta oxidation, and it's very basic biochemistry. So that's ketogenic diet versus metabolic ketosis. So what are some pluses about making ketones? Well, any way you've got a big enough fuel shortage, if you pass some threshold and you make more ketones, it'll probably suppress your appetite. And if you're on a fast or on a food restrictive plan, obviously that could be useful not to be miserably hungry all the time. There's also data saying that those levels of ketones in some thresholds may, may help your mental focus and your brain function. And in the context of fasting or food shortages, that also makes sense. We're going to be sharp enough to find that next meal rather than just be despondent and you know crying in the corner or something. <laughs> So what are some negatives about having higher amounts of ketones? Well, a big one is that being in a state of metabolic ketosis that's severe enough very consistently shuts down thyroid function. And that works at many steps of hormone release and hormone conversion. In fact, it's so predictable that children put on ketogenic diets for epilepsy are closely screened and it's expected that they'll need to go on thyroid replacement therapy even if they've had no history of thyroid problems. So it's actually a really surefire way to slow your thyroid. It's also a very consistent way to elevate stress hormone levels like cortisol. And here's why. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid. So when there's not adequate amounts of carbohydrate entering your bloodstream or adequate amounts of stored carbohydrate in your liver in the form of glycogen, your body uses cortisol to help all the processes to form new glucose and to go into ketosis. So you rely more heavily on stress hormones. Once that happens, there's a few things that predictably go along with that. And one of which is your sleep quality can rather consistently tank. Some studies have shown that even getting close to ketosis within one to two days, your REM sleep may go down by more than a third. Other negative can be loss of muscle mass because you always do need to have proteins even to make ketones 
And if they're not coming from your diet, they come from your arms and your legs and your, your chest and your back and your shoulders, places where you want to have muscle mass. That's where you get the proteins to make up the difference to burn fats and make them into ketones. Other drawbacks, you can encourage yeast overgrowth. Uh, this has been shown that if you're too low in carbs, because you're so devoid in quality fibers and variety of fibers, that it's common to see overgrowth of intestinal yeast. Another big one is you run the risk of being low in essential micronutrients. So there's macronutrients and micronutrients. And the micronutrients are the vitamins, minerals, the fibers, the phytonutrients. And ketogenic diets contain very few of those. If you have too much per plant foods, you'll be pushed out of, out of a ketogenic state. And the drawback is you're missing a lot of essential stuff your body needs. So those are some drawbacks about that. So the idea is that you want to have a state of fuel flexibility. You know, you really want your body to be able to burn fuel, store fuel as need be, and not be dependent upon certain types or certain ratios of food, and to be able to have some leeway. And some days you've got more food and some days you've got less, but your body can stay stable despite those changes. And that's, that's what's ideal. So the big promise of, of ketogenic diet being like a magical tool for weight loss, you know, it only leads to weight loss if there's a fuel deficit. There's no, there's no chain reaction. It doesn't make your body start burning your fat up out of control. There's an old joke about how you could have a coupon saying that this coupon plus a dollar will get you a free cup of coffee at Joe's Diner. And the joke is that, you know, it's a dollar for a cup of coffee anyway, so the coupon is worthless. So a ketogenic diet at a low fuel state can cause weight loss. But guess what? Any kind of a diet you could insert there at a low fuel state will cause weight loss. A Twinkie diet has been shown to cause weight loss at a low fuel state. So if you want to go into metabolic ketosis and be below a threshold in terms of having less hunger, that's reasonable. But you can do that eating a good variety of quality protein and lots of plant foods and lots of fiber rich foods. If you're thinking about ketosis in terms of a way to help brain aging or brain functioning, let's stay tuned. That's rather theoretical. And there's quite a bit of data saying that the highest fat diets actually based on 12 large, I'm sorry, 11 of the 12 human studies done on that topic to date probably work against the goals of healthy brain aging, diets that are high in fat and high in saturated fat. And what do I mean by high in those things? Well, more than about 30, 40% of calories. So we need fats, fats are good. But right now we're in a stage of going too far thinking that we wanna focus only on fats. And they're really low in the variety and the type of nutrients that they offer. So we need them, but we don't need just them. We need a large variety of lots of good foods. Dr. Christensen here with you. Take great care and we'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.